Before I start, I would like to request the members of the audience to post their questions if they have any during the session on the right side of the screen in the Q&A dialog box. Good morning, ladies and gents, esteemed officials and delegates, members of the media and audience. I am Ashita Goha, and on behalf of National Skill Development Corporation, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you and a very happy Independence Day. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope that today's session at Charcha 2021 will be a learning and fruitful experience for all of us. Moving on to the first session of the day, which is themed Investing for India, in Investing for Impact, the Case of India. The panelists are Dr. Manish Mishra, Consultant, Sankal, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Arunesh Singh, Chief Executive Officer, Generation India Foundation, Salim Khan, India Director, British Asia Trust, Seema Bansal, Partner and Director, Social Impact, Boston Consulting Group. The moderator of this session is Dr. Avneet Kaur, who is the head, Corporate Strategy and International Collaborations, National Skill Development Corporation. Dr. Kaur is a Public Policy Development and Human Resources Specialist with over 15 years of international experience. She's also an expert in skill development policy and program interventions and organization management strategies. May I now request Dr. Kaur to introduce the panelists and begin the session. Over to you, Dr. Kaur. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Ishita. And thanks, Sandhilya, who is at the back end here. Uh, I'm of me. Uh, very warm welcome to everyone. And thanks a lot to the panelists for taking time out uh, and to the audience for taking time out on a Sunday and joining us today. Um, and happy Independence Day as well to everyone. Before we start, and I know we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot to share on this session, and I would keep most of the time for the panelists. But I just wanted to take this opportunity to set the context for why is NSTC engaging with this charcha on impact investments today? Um, so just a bit of a backstory here. Uh, and most of you might be aware of this, but you know, NSTC, as we know, was founded in 2009 as a public-private partnership uh, uh, with a shareholding from private industry chambers and the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, and the mandate for the organization was to create a market-led, competency-based skill development ecosystem. Now, to support this mandate, NSTC was provided with a corpus of funds through which NSTC has created large-scale skilling capacity. And as I will rattle down some numbers, but just bear with me, they are pretty impressive, as you can see. Uh, this skilling capacity consists of over 600 uh, training partners that operate over 1,100 training centers with an annual capacity to train 5 million persons. Uh, NSTC has also developed standards and incubated 37 sector skill councils that have certified 26 million persons in the last 10 years through a cadre of 70,000 trainers and assessors. So, you know, we have uh, impressive numbers to speak of, uh, but through this journey of, uh, of building capacity, I think we are now at a stage where the system is mature enough to uh, focus and shift the conversation a bit from um, scale and output to quality leading to outcomes and impact. Uh, there is also, in addition, keenness from the private sector to participate in this conversation in a more engaging manner, both from a funding perspective and also the uh, uh, from their technical expertise perspective. Uh, so moving on, uh, we believe that uh, today NSTC is therefore well positioned to leverage both the industry and the government and, you know, bridge this ideological gap between the private investor and the public funder. Uh, therefore, we are actively seeking to work with stakeholders to foster responsible investment, leading to sustainable quality outcomes. Uh, NSTC in this journey is also looking at the entire spectrum of investments from grants on the one end to uh, VC firms on the other and CSR and philanthropy donors in the middle. 
Uh, so we believe that you know by engaging in dialogues such as uh, this forum today, uh, we would be able to gather deeper insights from the combined experiences of leading experts in this area. Uh, and I would quickly introduce our panel. Uh, to uh, you know to start with, we have uh, Ms. Seema Bansal, who is the partner and director of social impact at the Boston Consulting Group. Seema has been with BCG for over 20 years and leads the firm's social impact practice in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, a majority of SEMA's work involves uh, central and several state governments, foundations, development sector organizations, and NGOs. She has worked extensively in education across and as well as other topics like health, food distribution, and agriculture. Seema is a TED and TEDx speaker as well as a host. She has a BE from uh, Peck Chandigarh and an MBA from AM Calcutta. So we can uh, really look forward to some uh, very good uh, dialogue with Seema here. Uh, I'm also pleased to have Mr. Salim Khan, uh, who is the India Director of British Asian Trust. Salim Khan comes with over uh, decades of experience spanning the private and the not-for-profit sector. Over the last two years at the British Asian Trust, Salim has helped to develop the trust's identity and vision in India. He has extensive experience uh, of creating and nurturing philanthropic business and cultural relationships across India and South Asia, which is today helping to tackle some of the most pressing issues facing the continent. Uh, prior to joining the British Asian Trust, Salim was the chief executive at United Way of India and has held uh, several other leadership positions uh, across large multinational companies. Uh, Salim has a degree in engineering and an MBA from the University of Mumbai. Um, also very pleased to have Arunit uh, Singh, who is the chief executive officer at Generation India Foundation. Uh, Generation is a global nonprofit that works across 14 countries and 190 cities. Uh, they focus on training and placing the young generation and mid-career learners uh, for professions across various sectors. Uh, prior to joining Generation, Ar uh, Arunesh was uh, the chief of party of US aid funded Shops Plus project. And SHOP stands for, as I'm reading now, sustainable uh, sustaining healthcare outcomes through the private sector. Uh, so he has worked uh, also worked with uh, Population Services India and uh, um, across certain WASH programs, including a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded sanitation program. He comes with extensive uh, experience across uh, working across donor agencies, governments, corporate sector, including multinational foundations. And uh, finally, we have uh, uh, Dr. Manish Mishra, who is the lead for uh, the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship's uh, World Bank funded project, SIMO. Uh, and SIMO stands for Skill India Mission Operation. Um, Manish has worked uh, both with the private and government sector in a career spanning 20 years. He currently, as I said, leads the Sankal project at the ministry. Uh, as part of which uh, he's working on a wide range of issues, including convergence in skill development space, design, monitoring and evaluation of programs and schemes and on catalyzing private sector participation in skill development. Manish is a PhD in management and prior to Sankalp, he has worked with the UI, UITAI, the Aadhaar program uh, organization and uh, other corporate organizations. He has also taught at the University of Bradford, Dublin Institute of Technology in India. So as you can see, we have a very um, uh, an impressive uh, list of panelists with us today and without taking any more time if i could uh, you know just dive into the first question which uh, Seema, if you don't mind taking that, I wanted to understand from you, what do you think you know, is the significance of responsible investment, uh, particularly in this post-COVID era where resources are scarce and need to be deployed uh, judiciously? So over to you, Seema. Thank you. I mean, firstly, thank you so much for having me uh, and thank you to Chacha as well. Uh, such a pleasure to be on this panel along with, uh, you know, just this wonderful set of speakers. So I'm looking forward to listening more uh, rather than speaking. Um, as to your question, I, I think firstly, the, the topic itself is very interesting. Um, the fact that there is a case for investment to be made. So while, yes, I think, um, you know, there's been a significant amount of investment by the government itself, by the ministry and, and many other sort of uh, arms of it. In the skilling space, as as we work in the skilling space, you know, in with the central government, with state governments, etc., we see many places where there are, you know, still significant gaps. Um, 
content continues to remain a very large gap you know skilling content especially for some of the new age sectors there's a few sectors where it's well developed but there's many not um over the last one and a half years of covid we realized the need for digital content and which is effective and impactful which actually leads to learning um you know that honestly doesn't exist as much as it should um when we think about some of the sectors of the future uh, you know which are coming up whether it be around sustainability electric vehicles and so on and so forth um are uh, is skilling content actually being developed there right um i think counseling and mentoring of students uh, so while there's a lot of sort of investment in the classroom transaction and of actually skilling someone and giving them a certain hours of skilling but you know counseling and mentoring uh, is not there and then finally of course impact um, investment impact measurement and uh, that is another place where i think there is a you know paucity so if one wants to as the as an external ecosystem player whether it be a foundation whether it be csr whether it be impact investing think about where they can invest in the skilling space i think there are many many gaps which exist which can actually take the entire ecosystem further in terms of responsible investing i think i only want to make um, you know a couple of points the first is that when we invest in systems and when we invest in government systems um recognizing that that creates a disproportionate focus on one thing and you know it privileges one set of actions and you know takes away attention from another set of actions right um and let me take an example from another space which is you know similar but different right so when we think about education for example so if we invest and create a lot of focus in a state let's say only on literacy right um the same teacher will actually probably stop focusing on numeracy because you know there's an external in investor there's impact assessment there's high stakes related to one something right so i think it's very important when we invest in government systems to really actually think about what our investment is how our investment is going to impact um, the entire ecosystem if you invest in one geography for example within a state it's likely that senior uh, leadership bandwidth is actually going to go in within to into that geography those three districts and not other things right and i think sometimes as an outsider because we want to be focused we want to create in depth impact i don't think we necessarily think of the impact our investments um have um on the system as a whole and what it privileges and what what it takes away attention from and where does that take the system and i think the second thing is the right judicious balance in how one thinks about impact right so i think quantitative impact is very very important but i think so is also looking at qualitative systemic um impacts um so are we measuring you know just very specific quantitative elements but or are we also looking at system capacity building um you know long term sort of system thinking um you know setting up of processes which are actually helpful which may or may not necessarily lead to immediate results so i think balancing qualitative as well as quantitative impacts is the other thing i would say so so think so all of my work is around systems work and i think thinking about how investments impact the system as a whole is very critical um as we think about uh, investing sure thanks seema so that's uh, that's really uh, crucial the points that you brought up in terms of the significance of content uh, content uh, both digital and offline uh, counseling and mentoring the significance of monitoring and evaluation um of course you know responsible investing which is i think uh, a bit overlooked in our uh, you know in our zeal to like you said uh, show results uh, particularly focusing on a on a specific area which comes at a cost uh, of others uh, that perhaps get uh, neglected um uh, and as we can see that there are various threads that are coming out uh, from this discussion so arunish if you are able to tie this together and uh, help us understand uh, you know what is the sort of uh, uh, enabling ecosystem that is required uh, in terms of policy regulation and other mechanisms to bring investments and impacts of the kind that we are uh, looking at so sure. Uh, but first of all thank you so much abhi for having me and to the nat foundation for giving us this invitation and a very happy independence day to everybody uh what i am going to do is uh, you know start off with some level of context in as far as and i'll keep this very specific to the skill sector uh you know first of all uh, you know outcome based skilling 
this by itself uh, sort of uh, a new concept, a relatively sort of nascent concept in as far as the skill sector is concerned. As we all know uh, that the focus has largely been on training and, you know, as have been the payouts, you know, uh, till, uh, till about, uh, uh, you know, about a year ago, the payments were being made to the extent of about 80% uh, to certification and now it's about 70 percent so basically what we are doing is that we are incentivizing the completion of training as being sort of uh, the main outcome rather than placements and retention so i think that's that's a very important context and uh it's also it's it's a welcome change to see that we are now shifting uh to you know outcome based skilling and that, i think that's 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 a big move by itself by just thinking it through and then comes in the entire systems change in the processes that are required but i just thought that it would be very important to set this context as we get into sort of ecosystem uh, you know enablement now when you think of an ecosystem you need to first understand who are the players in that ecosystem and you know what is the role that each of these players make and then how do we then get to a point where we are able to coordinate uh, you know, the, the various uh, stakeholders and the activities that they undertake. And I think the first and the most important uh, is the government uh, and public-private partnerships such as NSTC, you know, because the leadership comes from there. And to be able to A, recognize that there is a gap and then start addressing the gap, you know, both in, in as far as outcomes are concerned or as far as, uh, you know, uh, what are the investments that are required to be made. So I think the first first step comes from the government and I'm really happy, very pleased that, you know, this conversation is actually happening and that, you know, the policy guidelines are being created, that we are creating the funding required uh, to be able to have, you know, uh, outcome based uh, skilling. And then, of course, whatever that's required and as far as creating a learning agenda, because ultimately the whole idea is to be able to conduct these kind of, uh, you know, projects or pilots, if I may, and then have these uh, informed to policy. So I think the first uh, player in as far as this ecosystem, uh, any any in, uh, in enabling ecosystem will have to be the government. And the government has been the largest investor in as far as the skill space in the country is concerned. I think the second uh, most uh, important uh, uh, sort of uh, player in the ecosystem, and please, uh, you know, do not uh, do not think that I'm not speaking of the learner because everything centers around the learner. So they are right at the center, right at the middle of every conversation that we have. I really am positioning sort of, uh, you know, players in the ecosystem around uh, around the learner. So like I said, the government, of course, is the first investor or the first sort of most important uh, stakeholder. I think second comes in the industry. And I think this is where there has been some level of gaps wherein, uh, and I think Seema was talking about this as well, that, you know, the content, there is still sort of gaps in the content. Why do we have uh, you know, gaps in the content? Because we aren't speaking sufficiently to the industry in as far as what the needs of the industry are. Uh, you know, any skilling initiative should be able to first understand, you know, what are the pain points of, 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 of the employer or the industry and then create the curricula around the, those pain points so that any, any kind of a training that is provided to these learners or to the youth is very relevant to both the learner as well as to the youth. So I think that conversation is extremely important. I know NSTC does immense work through the sector skill councils to enable that. And I think that conversation or that sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, the, the sort of exchange of ideas need to be a lot more often. I think the second part, uh, which, uh, you know, again comes from the employer, which I would refer to as, you know, private sector participation, is from the investment part of it. You know, as a donor, how do we get the... Uh, the industry to get involved in the skills ecosystem. I mean, one of the uh, proxies, I would say, to, a, uh, to, the, uh, to the industry recognizing the efforts of the uh, skills sector is that the skills sector starts getting paid for it, uh, you know, to some extent. Or at least, if nothing, there is some level of investment that's happening from 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 the from the from the industry. And I think this should go beyond just CSR. It just doesn't have to be, uh, you know, that level of investment. Because other than the learner, the largest investor or the largest beneficiary of uh, any skills initiative is the, uh, are the is the industry or the employers. And then lastly, I think I should talk about the training partners. The training partners clearly are the ones who are implementing all of these, uh, you know. Uh, initiatives and to be able to enhance capacity of a trading partner to provide or sort of execute such uh, projects is extremely important. And last but the not and last but not the least, I know I've taken a minute extra to sort of uh, speak of this, but I think as part of an enabling ecosystem, there is also the need for a, a project management unit who is basically able to bring all of these people together. 
you know, understand what are the needs of each of these stakeholders and then create sort of really enable uh, this, you know, enabling ecosystem to perform. I think that's that's extremely important. So I think that's where I come from largely, that each uh, stakeholders' needs have to be understood. And then there has to be a coordinating unit that is able to bring all of them together in ensuring that such, uh, you know, such projects uh, get implemented and that they're finally able to speak to us. Uh, I'll stop here. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Arunesh. And thanks for reiterating the fact that, you know, this is fairly new space for India. Um, um, and I think there is a, uh, and for, uh, of course, um, um, telling us about the various stakeholders from the government to the private sector, uh, keeping the learners right at the center of this conversation. Uh, so I think there is, you know, definitely a need to also demystify this entire process and know what has been happening internationally in this area. Uh, we all know that there is not much evidence that we have in India. But uh, Salim, uh, uh, you know, British Asian Trust has been at the center of these conversations globally. Uh, would be great if you're able to throw some insights from international evidences that could perhaps help us to broaden the case for uh, uh, impact investments in India. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Abneer. Uh, so firstly, the post-COVID world is not the same at all. So uh, uh, so talking about evidence evidences from the past may not be totally relevant as fundamental assumptions with which they had been approached uh, and, and the interventions and opportunities that they brought, those have now been completely challenged. Uh, that said, while it is a challenge, it also brings a very significant opportunity uh, to the table. Uh, what is important is some of the points that Arunesh made around building an enabling ecosystem, uh, the need for public policy that is supportive, regulations which are enabling for bringing longer term sustainability to interventions and also the shift from paying for inputs to paying for outcomes uh, and and in in the area of skills as arunesh rightly said outcome based uh, skilling because uh, that is that is the significant shift that we are seeing you know across uh, investors both globally as well as locally uh, but some points that we should note firstly the world we all know some of this, but I'm saying the world needs about uh, $2.5 trillion every year until 2030 to meet the SDGs that have been defined. Uh, uh, and if you have any chance of meeting SDGs, uh, investors, the impact investors specifically need to perhaps step up to inspiring global mainstream investors to come in and, and sort of bring in you know, more investments to the table. One, uh, Secondly, while India is relatively nascent in its involvement, in impact investing, uh, the global impact investment market has been growing at an unprecedented scale. Just, just looking at the last two years, the market grew from uh, uh, $502 billion in AUMs for in 2019 to $715 billion, I'm said, in, in 2020. And this is when you know, COVID had hit, uh, but with it came a lot of opportunities. Uh, and then if you move the lens to India, uh, there are significant local opportunities that we are seeing. Firstly, the opportunities with individual philanthropists, high net worth individuals who want to engage and invest for uh, social returns. Uh, and then the, the local CSR capital. We've our conversations with, uh, uh, with most corporates are telling us that CSR Capital is looking at avenues to actually look at tracking and supporting outcome-based uh, uh, intervention. So, uh, but they come with a fairly restricted, you know, framework. So the uh, the opportunity of private capital is there, uh, but there is a lot to solve for be before it gets applied. And then this huge opportunity of you know partnering, uh, uh, you know, with the public capital. So basically partnering with the government, etc. And one change that we have seen really is the uh, engagement that has stepped up with the government for talking impact and their openness to look at partnering with private capital and uh, and looking at innovation in a big way you know how how things can be done differently and how things can be done for uh, impact so uh, at bat we are strategically placed as that body which uh, you know has had some uh, 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 success with some outcome based 
contracts that we've done is especially in the area of education we had our education impact bond as some of you may be aware it's it's in its final year now it's in two years actually a year and a half of covid but despite that you know pivoting to covid uh the in, the investor sentiment remained intact and uh, uh the interventions continued and we've seen some superlative results uh what's important is how do you take evidence from uh, uh these interventions and apply it to uh a, you know longer term mainstreaming and those are that those dialogues are dialogues with with the government and and i'll be really keen to hear what manish has to say to some of these you know mainstreaming interventions so just one example and i know uh, there's paucity of time but just out of our education you know work i mean if there is one evidence that we are able to put out now is uh, 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 you know a rate card of sort a rate card which actually will simplify uh, the way with which you are able to specify uh, uh, for what outcome you know what is the return that the investor can be paid and also taking a rate card like this to actually go and talk to the government about the various kind of interventions that you know came to the table and at what price point you know was uh, 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 an outcome you know delivered so that the government's able to pick up you know engage understand and then you know sort of uh, mainstreaming it ideally in in the in their practices in terms of how they you know engage with work so that dialogue has started which is very encouraging because our long term ambition will continue to be that and of course uh, right now we are at the helm of our uh, uh our next impact bond around scaling hugely exciting timing is you know perfect because it's going to bring thousands of unemployed uh youth uh back into jobs there's going to be a 60% uh, gender participation so women and girls will primarily benefit out of it and if at all one experience that i want to talk about is our experience of working with the national skills development corporation which are the nodal body for the government representing the the openness for innovation the openness for uh, 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 looking at interventions differently uh, 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 collaborating with private partners in a manner which is really uh, going to help us deliver for success so we are very, very excited about this hopefully if all goes well we should be announcing that uh, later this month or next month so uh, lots lots very exciting times ahead opportunity is big it just depends on how we uh leverage and bring all of this together and and keep government right at the center of the conversations great uh, thanks uh, thanks so much uh, salim and uh, looking forward to that announcement um uh, thanks also for uh, you know reminding us uh, if we ever forget that this is the post covid world uh, and things are not the same um, and therefore evidence really needs to be generated we cannot rely on what we had in the past uh and to do that as you uh, think the sentiment in the private investors is still intact uh in fact i think they are coming back uh, with uh, you know greater uh, motivation to undertake uh, these uh, uh, to, uh, challenges and tackle such wicked issues as we call them um so uh, uh, with this system set out the way it is uh, manish uh, over to you to tell us uh, where does uh, you, what's the government's perspective and i know you've been doing some excellent work at the gram panchayat level so how how are those approaches structured what is the openness in the government so if you could just throw some light on that thank you thank you very much avneet thanks for having me here and uh, happy independence day to everybody and uh, i think uh, uh, this the stage is beautifully set with what seema started talking about as to what what are the recent developments salim is talking about this uh, bond that he is going to come up with uh, along with nsdc and arunesh uh, uh, with the, with the, with, the, with the project that we have uh, together uh, and uh, the 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 uh, kind of frameworks that he was talking about so thank you very much uh, i think uh, the focus in the government is increasingly moving towards uh, outcome uh uh going to the aware citizenry and uh, maybe evolved matrices through which you capture the performance of the governments and also compare it with the others the governments can't really uh you know avoid the scrutiny of uh, uh, the kind of developmental efforts that they are making and therefore this uh, one sees this shift 
as a matter of fact, the project that I uh, lead here for uh, Ministry of Skill Development's World Bank project is also funded under uh, 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 the the results framework, and uh, and uh, we 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 have a predefined set of outcomes that we are supposed to uh, show progress against uh, in order to receive that funding. The challenge, however, is uh, the capacity uh, in the system and the mindset, right? So uh, it's very easy to design a program which is like train, uh, uh, say, one crore people over one next four years, and half of that target should be shifted to the state governments, the rest uh, should be done by the national government. But to what end? Right? How does that skill training uh, help the enterprise in which, which will employ these people, the individuals themselves, or so the society at large? Uh, or, I mean, taking another example, and since uh, Abhi talked about this Panchayat thing, and we uh, are working there, and there are quite, quite a few projects that Sankalp uh, has started in Gram Panchayat in order to make the skilled manpower available to to offer quality uh, uh, civic services uh, in the Gram Panchayat areas. One is very clearly seeing that just laying those water pipelines and building those toilets is not enough. One very uh, clearly wants to put a mechanism in place, and the government is increasingly getting aware of it, uh, that repair, maintenance, and operation of those facilities are equally important. And for repair, maintenance, and operation uh, um, to, be, to be done uh, uh, in order to facilitate the usage of the assets that have been created, say, under Swaksh Bharat Mission 1, or for that matter, uh, under the Janjeevan uh, mission that the government has now undertaken, you need to create manpower of a certain kind. And not only create the manpower of a certain kind, link them to those developmental activities, activities which is where this, uh, this uh, capacity thing comes in, which is where this mindset thing comes in. right? Because the contracts, the way they are written, uh, they need to improve significantly. They need to focus upon what exactly is being uh, targeted by say, uh, uh, ensuring drinking water supply to all the households. When you talk about standards like a certain minimum quantity of drinking water to be available with every household every day, what does it mean? Does it only mean laying the pipelines or it also means regular upkeep of the infrastructure that is that has been put there? So how do we make those connections is going to be very, very important. So. Uh, Capacity building of, of this kind is, 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 is important. And we, we, are, we are seeing through our interactions with the district level and the, in the Gram Panchayat and PRI level machinery that uh, this is not going to be easy, right? Uh, and you need to have all, you know, be firing on all cylinders in order, in order to ensure that it happens. You need to bring in private sector with the innovative ways of building building uh, the sense of purpose amongst the government government uh, 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 officers. So it's one thing to decide decide to deliver service in a certain way at the national level or the state 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 uh, capital level. But to actually deliver it on the ground is 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 something that you need to need to work with those urban local body people, those PRI, PRI institution uh, 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 functionaries. So so we need to, you know, sort of uh, put our thinking caps on as to how do we uh, build this purpose? How do we train them uh, in writing those contracts better? In putting those SLAs in a manner in which they can be they can be uh, monitored and also enforced. So so capacity building is one very important issue. The second important issue is uh, that of routing these uh, uh, solutions that we are taking to uh, the people in the communities themselves. Unless and until we develop those uh, the, the community consciousness, uh, unless and until the demand comes from the people that we are going to serve, uh, unless and until that comes from there, I mean, there's no no great hope of a success. So, this coming back to the skilling example of yours, Arunesh, and also Salim talked about it. We we see a lot of mismatches across the value chain, be it. How do people are brought to the classroom for the skill training? How they are trained, and how the uh, 
they, they, are, they are put to the employers, there are mismatches, leakages everywhere. And why is it happening? Because we are probably uh, not bringing the right kind of people, not all of them. Uh, uh, we are probably not thinking innovatively of uh, how, how do we connect them with the employment opportunities or the self-employment opportunities, opportunities etc. So this, these mismatches needs, need to be addressed. I, I think the, 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 while, while industry is very important uh, point to start with and bring in industry and see what exactly they require and then train people accordingly, it's also important to engage with the communities and try and ascertain as to what they want, right? What are their aspirations? There's no point in training somebody in a remote part of Bihar expecting this person should actually be part of this city gas you know, uh, network expansion in a particular district and training the person on that, but this person has actually very, very different aspirations. And, and, and we have seen that, uh, uh, and the, 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 the history is replete with such examples. You have seen a uh, Bumako kind of an initiative in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where you actually involved the community in order to improve the healthcare services there. So this community involvement also is a, very, very important uh, uh, element that one, one uh, wants to uh, talk about. Thankfully, one is seeing uh, some, some development and uh, there are some very good success stories that have emerged. One uh, hears a lot of uh, uh, great things about this uh, Rajasthan's uh, Educate Girl initiative. One is also seeing this Pimpri uh, Chinchwad uh, and UNDP uh, project that has that, that, that was actually awarded last year. And uh, there has been some movement over last one year there. So as, as Salim was saying in the post COVID world, we probably need to uh, change this whole mindset in which we look at things, and especially in government sector, you, you, you uh, need to be thinking very, very imaginatively in order to uh, change that mindset and also capacity build this entire system in order to deliver those services better. So. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Manish. So that just shows how um, it's not an easy task. Uh, it's not uh, first easy to even, uh, you know, start mapping the various stakeholders that are uh, involved in a process, particularly in the case of skilling, which also happens to be a horizontal. So we are not, uh, you know, dealing in one setting. Uh, we are having to deal with multiple settings with a cross section of various stakeholders, both from the government and the uh, others. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, Salim, if you are you have done this and you've, at uh, BAT you've done this very successfully and I know that it's uh, challenging um, but if you could talk about uh, you know what is this journey of uh, working with multiple stakeholders and how do you do it in a manner that sets uh, the design for success sure sure thanks Abneet and uh, this is so apt in terms of timing and relevant and uh, and and more so around skilling because I can talk to our own experiences of working with an absolutely brilliant uh, set of consortium partners who are coming together for the scaling impact bond. Uh, firstly, I wouldn't call them challenges. I think hugely exciting uh, questions, perhaps which need the rightly uh, thought out answers is perhaps, you know, something that this whole exercise is about. So uh, first I would say, uh, you know the uh the tough task is you know sorry can everyone mute i don't know i'm getting a kind of a sorry oh, thank you very much uh so um first is the collaboration part of it identifying right partners whether it is private investors uh uh, uh both international and local funders uh public investors government etc uh because one thing that we've learned is collaboration is not easy. Collaboration is quite hard because you get stakeholders at the table with very different thinking, different mindsets, experiences, etc. And working with all of that, navigating through that and making sure that you are all pushing in one direction, to my mind, has been the number one uh, uh, hard task you know, for us. And, and some of, uh, and uh, Avneet, you will definitely be able to you know sort of acknowledge uh, that second is uh, the whole conversation around uh, designing for outcomes but you know when you and you need to be clear about the difference 
in that today uh, if you go and i made this point earlier as well if you go if you're talking to investors they're talking to funders everyone wants to bring capital for delivering end outcomes now especially more so in a post covid world so making sure that you design for the right outcomes and that again is not an easy exercise it requires a good understanding of the intervention for example in our scaling impact bond it first required a lot of learning on how the how currently the government systems around scaling are uh, funded and then saying if you want to add some innovation and look at uh, 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 doing a pay for success model we shifted try to shift the lens to uh, paying for outcomes so uh, that required us to understand what are the critical set of challenges you know in the scaling ecosystem right now and what strongly came out was uh, uh, paying for placements uh, and paying for and making sure that people stay in jobs and of course there was elements around ensuring that the women in workforce uh, number is also sort of accounted for we just keep gender right in the center of those conversations so in this this particular uh, impact bond a, a large part of the funding is going to be paid only on and I, I know there's a question in the chat box around that and hopefully this answers that is uh, is around you know paying for the right outcome so paying for placements paying when people are placed in jobs and the biggest uh, uh, and and the most critical outcome would be ensuring that you know people stay in jobs so you know uh, either a 3 month or a 6 month retention and where a large part of the payment you know really happens and it's not an easy journey because service providers will take some time to make that shift so it's like a sliding scale currently where they are to if you want to over the four years of intervention make that shift happen you know it is it is designing for that and and other pieces are actually is navigating through the regulatory framework and aligning all legals around that uh, that's that's been that's been a tough uh, navigation exercise so the regulatory frameworks are different for different kind of capital csr for example while a significant opportunity the framework is quite tight what they can can't do so it's about making sure that you understand that have the right solutions and then you have the right legal terms which actually also ensure that you know they are safeguarded and protected in all ways so uh, these are some of the things i wouldn't uh, the biggest shot in the arm is actually you know government participation i i would had I not gone through this experience, perhaps would have said that's going to be another set of challenges. But let me tell you, from our experiences, uh, recent experiences, I think hugely exciting times because governments open and Manish made that point very strongly. There are specific parts for innovation. Governments open for trying, testing out new models. Just need a set of people who can actually build that ecosystem and develop. So it's a journey which is well started right now. Hopefully, we have a long way to go and lots of impact to deliver. Right. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Salim. And I know what you mean. Um, so, you know, Manish, just going back to you, uh, the recurring theme, and as much as I was keen to demystify this entire process, uh, it still seems to be a bit complex uh, because of the very nature of the way this works. Uh, so from a systems point of view, you know, we've been hearing about uh, this social stock exchange. Do you? Could you just shed some light on what that is and how does that help us to really make this a smoother process and a more transparent process for all the various stakeholders involved? Manish, that was uh, for you. Maybe you are on mute. And also just a quick uh, check there. I think we have about five minutes. So, uh, uh, you know, if everyone can just be a bit mindful, we also want to stop on time or they'll just start, you know, they'll just end the session. So we will have a nice chat after this. But if you could stick to time as well. Thank you. So I, I missed that uh, point. I mean, I was. Sure. It was on. Uh, if you could tell us something about the social stock exchange, how does that come into this picture? Okay, social stock exchanges, and I think uh, Salim, uh, while he was uh, uh, making a comment on um, the private sector investment and how impact for investing can actually be uh, uh, made useful, he he made a mention of a figure saying two point five trillion dollars is the is the total requirement uh, if at all the SDG goals have to be met by twenty thirty. I think. For India, as per a UNDP estimate, the, the figure is about $1, $1 trillion. And uh, 
there is a shortfall of about say five sixty million dollars um, as per that estimate, and that has got to be while government continues to be the major funder for all the developmental uh, initiatives, that money has got to come from somewhere. And uh, he also talked about uh, the uh, um, infirmity and also the problems with the framework through which the private money can come in and probably a, a more robust framework is required. And I think uh, social stock exchange is one such framework that has been experimented with, uh, that is being uh, actually mooted uh, uh, in the last year's 2019 budget. I think uh, the finance, finance minister made an announce, announcement uh, um, about this, and then there was a, a recommend, set of recommendations by the working group that was set up for uh, the social stock exchanges. Uh, so this this actually gives you a more systematic framework through which uh, the organizations uh, that are working for impact can access to funds, and uh, ex accessing private sector funds otherwise is very, very uh, ad hoc, and also based upon uh, uh, the kind of relationship that you have with funders and who you know, uh, this would rather be uh, a more robust market mechanism through which the funds can be raised. Mm, still at the uh, idea stage and the recommendations have been made, uh, 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 it is uh, still some time away before we see this uh, happening. Mm, but I, in my understanding, it's a, it's a, it's a very good move because uh, uh, the non-profit organizations and also for the for-profit organizations and, and uh, a small section within the non-profit organizations that is section 8 companies can make use of uh, this funding mechanism though the though the instruments that are available uh, for them to raise capital uh, and the social capital are are different like a, a not-for-profit organization can largely think of uh, raising capital through a social venture uh, so this Social, uh, um, uh, 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 social impact fund, and uh, the equity, etc., is available more to the uh, for-profit uh, sector organizations. Uh, what it uh, allows uh, you to do is uh, they are um, in Schedule Seven of uh, the Companies Act 2013. There are some 15 activities that have been uh, uh, identified from that Schedule Seven. And also the developmental priorities identified by Niti Aayog is what you can, um, uh, um, you 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 have to be engaged in order to raise in order to get listed on a on a social stock exchange and raise money from there. Um, uh, there there's a there, there, there's a capacity building fund also of close to 100 crore rupees that is going to put in place because uh, this would actually require the non-profit organizations etc to. Uh, report what they are doing continuously to the authorities and for that the capacity building uh, of these uh, NPOs are required to be done because uh, you know that there are so many NPOs that are very tiny uh, as far as the operation or as far as their size etc is concerned and also the entry threshold for listing yourself under the um, uh, social stock exchange is not very high I think uh, uh, you should have raised about 10 lakh rupees last year and should have uh, you know sort of spent about 50 lakh rupees minimum uh, to be a part of the social stock to be to get listed as a social stock exchange entity is something that uh, uh, has been recommended so uh, all these organizations would in order to meet their reporting requirement would need some kind of a capacity building so that capacity building uh, fund has actually been separately earmarked under the under the recommendations that have come in uh, the many advantages, as we all know, that there's so much of uh, uh, private money that can come in, provided there is a proper framework. Uh, that will also bring in some kind of a standardization in the in the kind of service that uh, these organizations offer, and also raise the awareness amongst the nonprofit entities themselves, and open up a lot of opportunities for uh, uh, for the for the nonprofit organizations to. Uh, offer better better services as some of the some of the advantages. Uh, what has been uh, not allowed under under uh, the recommendations is corporate foundations, also political and religious organizations. They also can't participate in this. So it's very clear uh, uh, identification of the kind of activities that cannot be uh, uh, cannot be allowed for any entity that 
is desirous to raise funds through uh, 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 social stock exchanges. I think a very good move on the whole, uh, considering mm -hmm. um, there is money required and government, while being the, the main funder, as Salim was also talking about, uh, the main stakeholder, main funder, but you still need a lot of money in order to ensure that everybody gets uh, uh, portable mm -hmm. drinking water, everybody gets the kind of education and decent livelihood, etc. And uh, there's so much of emphasis in the climate change, etc., etc., etc. So uh, money is required, and this can actually be raised from the market uh, from various individuals who are ready to uh, uh, who are ready to put their money in, but they are looking for a uh, framework through which they can they can invest this money. Okay. I think one 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 good example is HDFC's cancer fund. Yeah. Uh, which which gets often talked about. Um, so so uh, going forward, one one would see uh, more such uh, initiatives from the from the corporate uh, mutual funds and also a lot of other organizations that are active in the financial market. So Great. thanks uh, thanks Manish. No, that definitely you know deserves a longer conversation, and uh, it's very good to know that um, uh, all this is gaining uh, good traction. Um, I, I think another pitch that I quickly, and I know we are running out of time, we have some very interesting questions in the chat box as well, which we will take back with us and uh, uh, get back to you soon. Uh, Seema, if you want to just take a minute, I'm sorry about that, but tell us about the critical role that technology, um, you know, as always plays, but more so in this uh, uh, piece of impact investment, what is the role of technology? So look, I think uh, firstly, in the last one and a half years, we've all learned, um, you know, how pervasive technology is, and and you know, and the possibilities of it. And of course, one has to be thoughtful and careful about, you know, the digital divide, lack of access, impact, effectiveness. Uh, but if you take the entire continuum of skilling for, you know, from like reaching out to potential, um, you know, candidates to actually enabling learning to, you know, training trainers to uh, long term impact assessment to uh, mentoring, monitoring, employment matching. I think one can see examples of technology being applied in the entire value chain. So I think there is some merit in actually taking the skilling value chain into and in all of its complexity and saying, how can technology be employed? I think the thing is, and I think this is a really important place where impact investing can come in, is to actually governments and systems struggle with creating high quality tech. They just do. Right. And and I think this is one place where the private sector can actually really play a very, very important role to create high quality tech systems, which, uh, you know, manage for all of the complexity of the system, different archetypes of, you know, beneficiaries, different delivery organizations, um, having sort of one single source of truth, having one single platform where all of this kind of comes together. I think there is a huge role for impact investing to play. And it's not just a one time build. You know, Uber, Urban Co, Amazon are not one time builds that you build it and then, you know, it kind of is, you know, serves. So it's also a continuous updation of this technology and technology platforms. And I think that's a really cool place where impact money and government systems can come together. One will have to think about how do you define outcomes, right? Because this is not the typical kind of thing where outcomes actually can be defined. You can't translate into number of people skilled or number of jobs created when you create long-term technology platforms. So that's a bit of a challenge, but I think it's a really exciting possibility for different stakeholders to come together. I'll just pause there, hand it back. Sure, sure. sure. Thanks so much. And, uh, you know, I hope uh, the right stakeholders are also listening in. We will definitely pass on uh, the good words that you've shared on this, uh, this issue, um, Seema, and look forward to working with uh, several of our partners uh, in engaging on these uh, important aspects of uh, right from social stock exchange to technology to, uh, you know, what at the end of the day, what are we designing for and how do you what are the uh, what's the learning agenda that we are trying to achieve out of this uh, and finally how do you really mainstream all these uh, you know nice uh, ideas that we have uh, experimented with in our microcosm to the uh, to the larger ecosystem so i suppose you know that uh, we could just thank you so much uh, uh, we are running out of time as well uh, thanks to the participants, thanks to panelists and everyone, and we hope to continue to engaging on such discussions and take this entire uh, idea of impact investments for the skill development sector in India forward. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, moderator.